Dear friends in Christ, please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, I give thanks to you for blessing us with the opportunity to come into your house this day. I thank you, Lord, for giving us a purpose and a, and a reason for this life. Help us each day to seek out your purpose for us. Give us guidance, direction. Fill our hearts with joy, knowing that we are your sons and your daughters. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 42. The number 42 is the number, according to Douglas Adams, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the number of the meaning of life, everything, or the universe and everything. If you're not familiar with Douglas Adams, he chose this number arbitrarily. He was a devout atheist who wrote this uh, series, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, actually, though, uh, as a science fiction series. He said this number 42, like I say, was arbitrary, just he randomly picked it out of the air. Uh, he said that he didn't really have a purpose behind it. But he did catch something that is somewhat important to us. How often do we wonder what the purpose of life, the universe, and everything is? How often do we ask those very questions? What is my purpose here? Why am I here? What am I doing on this earth? Is it more than just a big cosmic game? Am I here to beyond just being a checker or a chess piece that is moved as God wills it? A lot of people ask this question, whether they're in the church, whether they're outside the church. They wonder when they choose a career, what is their purpose? When they move somewhere, when they live somewhere new, what is their purpose? Why? When they have a family or decide not to have a family. When they grow older, what is their purpose? Why are they here? And how many times have you wondered that? Whether you're young or whether you've, you're advanced in years, how many times have you asked that question? Why am I here? Maybe as a Christian you've asked the question, what is the Lord doing with me here? Why, how is he still using me here? Have you ever asked that question and struggled to find an answer to it. Struggled to wonder exactly what the Lord could still do with you. Struggled to ask that question of how he can use that certain situation, that a certain affliction in your life for his glory. Well, we're not alone in these questions, are we? Like I said, whether we're in the church or whether out of the church, we ask these questions. Solomon asked these very questions in, our, in, our, in Ecclesiastes for today, our Old Testament lesson. Just go back to Ecclesiastes 2 with me, and right at the end, he, he, he had set up everything. He had great abundance. He had worked his hands to the bone, and yet he still was asking this question. Right at the end, uh, verses 10 and 11 here. Is there anything? Uh, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Everything was meaningless, or it was vanity to him. It was everything on this earth, the pleasures he'd found, the work that he'd done with his hand, he realized it's going to pass away. And so he wondered, what is my purpose? much like we wonder. And sometimes when we struggle to find the answer to that question, when we struggle even as Christians to answer what is my purpose here, we fall into the games of this world. We fall into the games of this life. And maybe we don't call them games, but they certainly seem like games. Who wins and who loses? Think about it in business. If you're a businessman or a businesswoman, am I making the most money for the company? Am I saving the most money for the company? In our schooling, who gets A's, who gets B's, who gets F's, and who gets C's? Or when we're in our relationships even, do people like me? Do I have the most friends? Do people come to me for advice? Do people trust me? But probably the worst place I see this game played as Christians even is in our relationships with God. Like I said, we may not call it a game, but we compare ourselves to others. We look at our own lives and we say, am I winning? Am I leading a holy life? Am I conquering sin today? Or am I not doing so well? Am I not playing by the rules as it may be? Am I backsliding, as some would say, failing to keep God's law? 
But even worse than that, we compare ourselves to others. We compare ourselves to the way someone else lives. And we say to ourselves, well, at least I'm not so bad as so and so. At least I've not done that. Much like the Pharisee and the publican. As they stood in the temple of the Lord, the Pharisee didn't really see that he was way out of the game. That he wasn't even measuring properly. The disciples did this too. If you remember, in Mark's account of the disciples walking on the road with Jesus, he said, James and John, they got into this debate about who was the greatest. Who was the greatest and who could sit on the left and who could sit on the right? Well, we know that it was not just James and John because Jesus heard the conversation. The other disciples heard the conversation. And in Matthew 18, we see how Jesus answers this. If we go to Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says to become like a child. Now when he says that, as Nicodemus was confused, he wasn't saying we have to go backwards in time. But he's talking about the faith a child has in their parents. How many of you, as you raised your children, even if you, as you've raised your grandchildren, your children trusted you implicitly? They trusted you until they, there was a reason they couldn't trust you, but most of you, they knew your trust. They didn't ask questions why until they got old enough to manipulate, but they trusted you. And that's what Jesus is saying we need to do is trust our Father. Trust our Father in heaven implicitly. Trust Him completely with everything in our lives. Trust that He is above the game of this life. Trust that He is above this world and in control. Easier said than done though, isn't that? Easier said than done as we seek our purpose and seek our place in this world to trust Him completely and implicitly. Easier said than done to be like that little child. Instead, so often we, we, we seek after these, these different games in our lives, trying to find fulfillment, even if it is temporary. We seek after these things in our lives, trying to find a win here or a win there, and never truly winning. Because you can never truly win apart from faith in God. And truly that game of winning and losing is more significant than just a game. Because it's more than just an arbitrary number, as Douglas Adams thought, but it is about our spiritual well-being. Because these traps are, these games are traps, and they are just meant to lead us from God's path. They are meant to lead us from what is most important. When we seek after success in business, yes, it's important to do well, but that's not the end all. When we seek after success in schooling, yes, it's important, but it's not the end all. When we seek after success in our relationships, it's important. When we seek after a right relationship with God. There is no true success apart from turning over everything, our sinful lives to Him. Notice instead of being about us, it's about God. And that's where our purpose begins. It begins in realizing it is not about us, but about how God is working through us. It is about how God is using you, how God is working through you on this earth, how He has given His life for you. We, well, we were all losers. Every single one of us. We were losers. We had failed at every rule, every law God had set. We had failed to keep the will of God, and we, well, we only had one punishment available to us. Death. Spiritual death. Until Jesus came and gave us true victory. You know, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes it so beautifully. 1 Corinthians 15. I encourage you to read the entire chapter. I'm just going to read a couple verses for you this morning. But the sting of death is sin. Truly, the law shows us our sin. It shows us the punishment for our sin, the punishment we deserve. And the power of the sin is law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have true victory not of ourselves, but through Christ's victory on the cross. We have victory not in what we have done, not in the way we live, but in what 
Christ has done for us. Our true victory comes in His defeat of sin, death, and the devil once and for all. And that victory is victory He gives to you and to me. And that is victory that we will experience not only in this life, but in the life to come. It is the promised victory that we will have eternal life with our Father. That we will walk with Him in newness of life each and every day. That we have a purpose here on this earth beyond just being here. But a purpose to change the world for God. And no, no, I can't tell you exactly how God is going to use you. But I know that you are here for a reason at this very time. Some of you, maybe you've even said this to yourself, but you, your parents might have told you you weren't planned. Anybody's parents ever say that? Well, God did plan you. God planned you to be here at this moment, at this very time. He planned your birth right when you were born. Did you realize that in the conception, there is over 80 million sperm, and God chose you out of that number, of, and that's on average, 80 million. He chose you. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's pretty amazing to think that you weren't just a random choice that you weren't just a number picked out of the sky, that you weren't just someone's mistake, but you were God's planned person. Now maybe, you know, it's true you might not see your name in the newspaper. It's true you might not see your, your name in the news as someone that the world considers significant. You may not cons convert a thousand people to Christ. That'd be pretty awesome, but you may not do that. You may not every day see the way the Spirit moves in your life. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't have purpose for you. And that God isn't using you right where you are right now. That God isn't using you to make changes in other people's lives. That God isn't using you significantly to change the world around you. You might not ever see the changes you make in someone's life. But God certainly does. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, He can change lives. He can take the dead and make them alive. Being a Christian, it doesn't mean your life will be perfect, but what it does mean is that we will see the joys of each day despite the imperfections, despite the pains of this world. Being a Christian, knowing our purpose on this earth, it doesn't mean that we will be perfect. No, we're still just as much sinners. But it means that we will, still, we will know where to go to repent of our sin. Being a Christian doesn't mean that every day you will feel the Spirit moving in your heart and in your life. What an amazing thing that it is. But you will know that the Spirit's working right around you in hundreds of thousands of millions of ways that you never even see. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to avoid hurt or pain. But it does mean that you know the one who dries every tear and takes away every pain. See, being a Christian, being one of God's people, it doesn't mean perfection on this earth, but it means victory in heaven. It means true victory where it counts. And so, yeah, it's not a game, this life, but we are meant to have fun. We are meant to have fun living as the people of God, not seeing as a duty or as a requirement to be His people, but seeing it as an opportunity, as a blessing, as an honor. An honor to be the people of God, to live out our faith, to be those ones who have been called according to His purpose, to do the good works that He has set in advance for us to do, to reflect God's love in our lives and in our world, to change our world, even if it is in small ways. And maybe some of you will have your name in newspapers. Maybe some of you will see lots of people converted. But chances are, you may not ever see the impact you have but that doesn't mean that God isn't using you. And don't forget that. Don't forget that in this life, God is using you. He is using you that you might share your word, that you might carry out His purpose for you. See, that's why we don't have to seek a purpose in this life. It's because God already has purpose for us. And when we're in a right relationship with Him, when we're taking that time to pray and engage Him in worship, when we're taking time to engage Him in His word, he shows us that purpose. I know it's not crystal clear. I'm not going to promise that. But the more time we spend in His Word, the more time we spend prayer in prayer with Him, the more clear He shows it to us. And yeah, we'll make mistakes. We'll make lots of mistakes probably. We'll sin. 
will fail to fulfill God's purpose for us. And that is why we keep turning to the cross, though. That's why we keep turning to that cross where God gives us His forgiveness. That forgiveness which cleanses us completely and wholly. That forgiveness which washes us and makes us white as snow. That forgiveness which gives us true victory that we might spend eternity with our Father. People of God, life is more than a game, but have fun living it for your Savior. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the people of God that you have sent here this day. I thank you for your word which you have placed upon their hearts, for the opportunity that we've had to share in today thus far to, to hear your word, to hear the richness of your love for us. We pray that as we live as your people throughout our lives and in this world, that you would lead us and that you would guide us, that we might bring honor to your holy name. Forgive us for those times when we get caught up in the games of this world, the, the winning and losing that is so unimportant. Forgive us for those times and remind us of what is truly important. Truly important is being your people, living as your people, living as people with a purpose, living as people showing your love to others. Lord, there are so many people who don't know your love and don't know your mercies. They don't know your forgiveness and they don't know your purpose for our lives in this world. And we pray that you would be with us and with those people, that you would use us to share your love with them, that they too might know your purpose for their lives, that they may not wander aimlessly, but know that there is a final destination. And for all who believe and are baptized, we shall be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.